sentence by means of the elimination rules for its main connective. So we just restrict to, 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 to connective, not to modifiers, at least for the main part of the talk. Uh, so what we can infer using the elimination rules should be no more and no less than what one needs in order to introduce the complex statement uh, using its introduction rules. And to, to, get, to get a bit of a see a couple of examples. So here, this, this, this two, uh, this collection of, the collection of introduction and the elimination rule consisting of this one introduction rule. Um, that means, well, so if we, if we consider our logical constant with this introduction and this elimination rule, well, it is plain that there is no harmony because what you get from the elimination rule has nothing to do with what you need in order to introduce a talk B using the introduction. And an example where we certainly have harmony, uh, or say where no one uh, questions the fact that the rule are in harmony, are the rule for conjunction, where what you get from the elimination is exactly what you need in order to introduce A and B using the introduction. Yeah? But uh, what I would like to concentrate on today is um, situation of this kind, where you see we have a logical constant that I will call a circle dot, uh, whose introduction rule is essentially the same as the one for conjunction, just with this circle dot connected in place of conjunction, and we have two elimination rules. The first one is the same as the first elimination rule for conjunction, and the second one is a weakened um, rule in which, um, in order to infer B from A circle dot B, we need an additional premise A. Now, clearly, if we have both rules at our disposal, uh, so the two rules together are exactly as strong deductively as the, strong, as the standard elimination rule, because if we want to infer B from A circle dot B, then we can first apply the first elimination when we get A, and then we use again A circle dot B and A obtained from A circle dot B to infer B, right? So deductively, um, the two collections of, so deductively, <laughs> these rules are as good as the, as the rules for conjunction. But in a sense, the rules doesn't seem to match each other as nicely as those for conjunction. Yeah? And so the question is, can we kind of define the notion of harmony in such a way that these um, rules do not qualify as harmonious, or at least not as harmonious as those for conjunction, yeah? And 
And since in essence the rules are from a, a level of derivability, you can't really distinguish between conjunction and the circle dot connective, then one may say that the notion of harmony I am after is kind of intentional, or say hyper intentional, if you want to use a uh, terminology that is pretty much in vogue, in the sense that you want to draw discrimination which are more fine grained than uh, interderivability. Okay? Um, Let's, uh, to begin with, I will, I will rely on some work that has been um, done, notably by, by, by Christian Schroeder-Heiss, but so the idea is that we can think, so a way of sort of approaching this problem is by first observing that we can code collections of rules using propositions. So what I mean? So in the case of uh, the rules for talk, we can say, well, the content of the introduction rule is essentially A. So in order to, so what is the, what, what, what content um, is encoded by the introduction rule for talk? Well, A, in the sense that if you want to infer A talk B, you need A. And what is the content of the elimination rule for talk? Well, it's B, because this is what you get from, from A talk B. And clearly the A and B has nothing to do with each other. Whereas in the case of conjunction, uh, well, the content of the introduction rule is that in order to infer the conjunction of A and B, you need both A and B. And so we can say that the content of the introduction rule is itself a, the conjunction of A and B. And in the case of the elimination rule, we have two rules, and say the content of each rule is read conjunctively in the sense that what you get from A and B is what you get from the first elimination and what you get from the second one. Right, um, but in the case of of the rule for our circle dot the introduction, the content of the introduction rule is the same as the content of the introduction rule of conjunction, but uh, the content of the sec of the first elimination rule is also simply A. But the content of the second elimination rule is that you can infer B conditionally on. So in order to infer B from A circle dot B, you also need A. That is, what you get from a circle dot b using the second elimination is that if you have a, you get b. So the implication a implies b, and so the content of the collection of elimination rule is a and a implies b, right? So from this very, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be too technical, so I'll just work a lot with example. I hope it will be fine for most of you, but if you want, we can in the discussion time get a bit more precise about all this. But anyway, a starting point would be the following. Well, when we, we certainly have atom when the introduction content is just equal to the elimination content. We have no harmony when there is no relation between the introduction and the elimination content. And well, this kind of middle ground is a situation in which the I content is interdivisible with E content, yeah, but still they're not the same. Yeah? And the question is whether this middle ground should qualify as harmony or not, in a sense. Now, a strong argument for saying, well, this middle situation should be qualified as harmony arises when we consider the rule for disjunction. Yeah? The rule for disjunction are the following. So these are the standard rules for disjunction, and I guess most everyone agrees that it, so these are the rule of disjunction and natural deduction. And I guess that every, most, almost everyone agrees that the rule are in harmony. And you see that here yeah, the collection of if the content of the two production rule is one case A and the other B, and the two, the two conjunction, uh, the two introduction rules are, so the content of the collection of introduction rules is obtained by, this by, by, by putting a disjunction between the content of each rule, in the sense that in order, you, in order to infer A or B, you can either establish A or you can establish B, yeah? And, but that's what is the content of the elimination rule? Well, the content of the elimination rule is the following, you can infer proposition Z, provided that you can show that Z follows from A and that Z follows from B. Yeah. So provided that you can establish that A, that Z follows from A and Z follows from B, then you can infer Z. Yeah. In other words, if A implies Z and B implies Z, then Z. Right? But Z is any proposition whatsoever. Right? So if we want to formalize the content of the elimination rule using a proposition, we need to quantify all of the z to make explicit this, this fact that we can choose the z as we go. Yeah? And, 
and so we obtain well we can sort of so the the, the way of so if we if we want to, to assign to every collection of rules a certain proposition we need to extend intuitionistic propositional logic with propositional quantification in order to, to consider rules of this form. Okay? But now you see that in this case, we also have that the content of the introduction and the content of the elimination are not the same proposition, yeah? Um, but still, they are to enter the rival of the proposition in the system of natural deduction for second order propositional logic, yeah? Um, to try to sketch the, the fact that they are into the rival, but I guess it may be a bit confusing. So the, the introduction and the elimination rule for the second order quantifier are the following. So from A, you can infer for all X A, provided that X does not fall free in any of the assumptions on which A depends. And the elimination rule tells you that from for all X A, you can infer A um, with C, replace C is an algebra proposition, replace in place of X. And to see that for all x, a implies x, and b implies x, implies x, we can reason as follows. So we um, we can eliminate the for all by instantiating x on a or b itself. So we get a implies a or b, and b implies a. B implies A or B. But you see that the antecedent of this implication is easily derivable because we know that from A we can infer A or B using the first introduction rule, and from B we can infer A or B using the second introduction rule. That is, if we well, if we have here two derivation consistent just of an application of the two introduction rule, we get this antecedent. Then we can infer A or B. And the other direction, I guess, is even easier. So from A or B, we can infer X from A and the premise A by the X, and we can infer um, X from the premise B and B by the X. And we compute X discharging both A and B. Uh, now the two assumptions a implies x and b implies x could have been obtained by by the um, by the conjunction a implies x and b implies x. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, and then we can infer a implies x and b implies x implies x. And we thereby discharge these two functions. So we have a derivation of A implies X implies B implies X implies X from A or B alone. So we can apply the introduction rule for the universal quantifier and we establish for all X a quantity. Yeah? That will, will, will give a bit of a flavor of the. So the idea that actually using the universal quantifier and the implication, we can define this junction is something that Russell already observed in the and that later Travis used in order to define a translation from the propositional intuitionistic calculus into the calculus which consists only of implication and the second order quantifier. Um, okay, so the two formula are interderivable, but still they're not the same, yeah? Uh, so in a sense, um, uh, well, so the, the proposal of Schoenhansen was to say, well, okay, look, we certainly have other when the I content is the same as the E content, but the case of disjunction shows that also when the I content is merely interderivable with the E content, we have harmony. Otherwise, we would be deemed to deny that the rules for disjunction are in harmony, which we are not ready to do. Uh, and that we don't have harmony when, the con when, the, when, when there's no interdervalibility between the I and the E content. Yeah? So in a sense, that's the, the proposal of Schoenhansen. But if we go this way, then we are buying uh, the thesis, so we, are, we, have, we are committed to the fact that also this circle dot, which I presented at the beginning, should qualify as harmonic, which is something not everyone would be ready to do. So I would like to kind of refine this, the, the thing in order to attain, well, 
Flotating situation with flotating a criterion of harmony on which well this junction is harmonious, conjunction is, but this circle dot isn't. Yeah, so how to do it? So um, an important aspect of harmony which is not which doesn't arise if one just look at the content of the rules, is that um, when the rules are in harmony, uh, certain certain transformation on the structure of derivation can be defined, which are referred to as reductions and expansions. So let, let's consider again the rules for conjunction. So um, the fact that the rules are in harmony is reflected, at least in part, by the fact that two kinds of deductive patterns can be exhibited. So um, the first one is consists by an introduction followed immediately by the corresponding elimination. So you see in the, in the derivation on the, on the left hand side, I can move, that we have, we have two deductions establishing A and B respectively, and then we introduce conjunction, and then we eliminate it, the conjunction again using one of the two elimination rules. And so one may say that the, derivative, the whole derivation contains a sort of redundancy because we actually already established A before introducing the conjunction, right? So the fact that we can get rid of this complex pattern, of this complexity peak, as it was called by Dami, um, in this way, but just kind of extracting the derivation of A, which we already had, reflect the fact that what you get from the elimination is no more than what you already had to establish in order to introduce uh, the, the main premise of the elimination in the first place, right? And, and another kind of uh, deductive pattern may be called a complexity valley or rift, in the sense that logical complexity goes down and then up again. And it is constituted by first applying the elimination and then the introduction. Um, you see from A and B, we first apply both elimination and we get from the disjunction all we need to introduce A and B back again. Yeah? So it's kind of the dual of what we had before. And here the idea is that the possibility of, say, expanding a derivation in this way, suppose we have deduced A and B, and from we make two copies of this deduction we first extract A, then B, and then we introduce A and B again. So the possibility of performing this expansion reflects, in some sense, the no less aspect of harmony. So the fact that what you get from the elimination is no more than what you need to introduce to introduce the conjunction back again. Okay? In the case of implication, uh, we also have this kind of transformations. Uh, we can define analogous transformation procedures. In this case, the reduction, so if we first introduce A implies B discharging a certain number of assumptions of the form A, and then you, uh, you have a reduction of A which you use to obtain B by both exponents, uh, but you could have established B without passing through A implies B by just using the deduction um, of A, um, and that the provided as a minor premise of both exponents, and then um, proceeding using the, the deduction from A to B to obtain B to other B, yeah? And, yeah, and usually if we have a deduction of A implies B, we can assume A straight away, and by both exponents we obtain B, and then we can apply in the implication of deduction we just discharge this assumption of A which we just assumed. And that shows that what you get by both exponents is no less than what you need But now, so, so let's consider now our rules for the circle dot. Uh, well, also in this case, we can exhibit two kind of deductive patterns. So uh, suppose we introduce, well, if, if we, the, the case of the reduction, so if after the introduction of the circle dot rule, we apply the first elimination rule for the circle dot, it's just the same as what we have to Conjunction, yeah? But if we, after an introduction of circle dot, we apply the second elimination rule, having the use A by means of the derivation B3, well, also in this case, we can get rid of this complexity peak by saying, well, just, just, take, the, just take the deduction of B2 that we already had. So also in this case, what you get from the second elimination is no more than what we already had in order to introduce a circle dot in the first place. Yeah, you're still following me. 
uh, and what about now the, the, the other pattern? So if we have a derivation of a circle dot b, well, we can first apply the true elimination rules. Um, and we obtain in one case a, and in the other case b, but observe that in order to obtain b, we also need, we also need a. But this is not a problem because we can obtain A using the first elimination. Yeah? In a sense, one could stipulate that deduction of this kind is fun in this way and that this proce transformation procedure reflects the no, the no less aspect of harmony. So it doesn't seem that requiring the availability of such procedures really makes a difference between conjunction and circle dot. Yeah? But still, one still has this feeling that also in this case, I mean, you can define this transformation, but they're not as nice and as in the case of conjunction. So can we find a way of getting, I mean, of you know, saying that this circle dot is bad, whereas conjunction is good? Um, well, um, I guess we can. And, and in order to arrive at this, uh, to, at this criteria, I would like to observe that Starting from this notion of transformation on derivation, we can introduce a notion called of isomorphism, which is um, well, which can be very useful for the for the purpose of, of this presentation. <laughs> so, um, so the first observation is that reductions and expansions taken together can be seen as inducing an equivalence relation on derivation or on deduction. Yeah. So. Um, the idea is that if you can obtain a certain derivation from another by performing one of these transformations, you can say that the two derivations belong to the same equivalence class. Yeah? And, and we get a, so we have our set of, of deductions in the system, and we get several equivalence classes, and in each equivalence classes we have derivations that can be obtained from one another by applying one of these transformation in one or the other direction, or possibly to some subderivations of this derivation, yeah? And this, this equivalence uh, relation is sometimes referred to as a notion of identity of proof, in the sense that one can think of formal derivation as, say, the syntactic representation of something abstract that we may call proof, so we may use the the proof for the abstracta uh, that are kind of obtained by quotienting the class of derivation modulo our equivalence relation. Uh, in a similar way, the number are the abstract entities which are represented by the numerical terms, right? So um, um, three plus two times four and um, and 12 times two are two syntactic representation of the same abstract entity. And I mean, the analogy can be pushed a bit forward in the sense that if you think of, I mean, if you take the, the action, say, of, I don't know, a formalized arithmetic theory like general arithmetic, and you read the, the equations for for the sum and the product of continuity, you get some say, rewriting rules that given a complex numerical terms allows you to rewrite this term until you get a numeral, right? And similarly, in a natural reduction system, if you start from a complex derivation that may contain several redundancies and valid and all that, by applying the reduction and expansion, so the inverse of expansion, you arrive at a so-called normal form, yeah? So that but, yeah. So anyway, we have an equivalence relation on the dark, on derivation, and using these, so thinking of it as a kind of inducing a notion of identity of proof, we can define a notion of an equivalence relation on propositions this time, which is a bit finer, more fine-grained than just interderivability. So the two propositions are interderivable means that there are two derivations, one of A from B and the other of B from A, right? Um, now, if we think, well, we can say that a, a derivation of A from B can be thought of as a function yeah, that has an open place corresponding to the assumption. 
Um, and when we put an input into the open place of this expression, we get a, we get a value, which is, which is a new deduction. Um, so if we, we can think of D1 as being a function from proof of B to proof of A in the sense that if we plug in on top of it a deduction of B that denotes or represents a proof of B, the whole thing will represent a proof of A, right? And so, since we have a notion of equivalence along with deductions available, we can introduce a more stricter criterion for constructing an equivalence relation on formula than just the availability of a function from proofs of A to proof of B and vice versa. Namely, what? What we can require not just the existence of two functions, but also that the, the existence of two functions which are the inverse of each other. So what does it mean that two functions are the inverse of each other? Well, that when you compose the two functions, you get the identity function, right? And now what is, what is, what are the derivations that represent the identity function on the set of proofs of a proposition? Well, the derivation that just consists of an assumption. Yeah? If you take the assumption of, the deduction consisting just of the assumption of A, we can think of it as a, um, as a function from proofs of A to proofs of A, in the sense that when you plug in a, proof, a deduction representing a proof of A, you obtain what the very same proof, yeah? And now, what does it mean then? You, how can we then define, how can we then express that D1 and D2 are the inference of each other in this sense? Well, by saying that when we put D2 on top of D1, and D1 on top of D2, we get two deductions, one of B from B and one of A from A, and these two must be equivalent to the deduction which expressed the identity function on the set of proof of B and the set of proof of A. Yeah. And, well, and this notion is called the notion of isomorphism. Well, isomorphism is usually, I mean, it's not just that there are two inverse functions on the two sets, but they also preserve some structure. In this case, there's not much structure to be preserved, but it's, um, I mean, it's at the limit case of an isomorphism that says a function about itself. Okay. Um, so, um, observe that, I mean, the notion of isomorphism is clearly dependent on the choice of an equivalence relation. So it is, in a sense, uh, isomorphism modulo the choice of an equivalence relation. In this case, it is rather natural to take eta eta, where eta is the relationship induced by the reduction, and eta is the equivalence induced by expansion. Okay. So, uh, some examples. So, A and B and B and A are interderivable, and it is easy to see that they are also isomorphic in the sense that if you take the easiest derivation of B and A from A and B that you can come up with, and the same for the derivation of A and B from B and A, and you put them on top of each other by applying the reductions. So the, if you eliminate the complexity peaks and you apply the inverse operation of eliminating the complexity valley, so if there is a valley, you just fill it up, <laughs> um, you shrink it up, then um, well, shrink, shrinking, shrinking, shrinking in both directions, you will get the identity Derivation. So the derivations consist just of the assumption of A and B and of B and A. And they are not just trivial uh, isomorphism. So typically, a non trivial isomorphism is distributivity. Uh, so A and B or C is equal to all the A or C and B or C. But if you do the whole calculation, then it turns out that they are also isomorphic. And then you, stay, you take the standard derivation of, of, of A or C and B or C from A and B or C. And and you put them together, then uh, by shrinking, 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 you get on both sides. Yeah, but uh, but not all uh, but not all interdependent claims also yield an isomorphism. In particular, A and A and A are distinct. So although interdependent, but they are not. And, and now it comes the interesting thing is that that suggests that we can use maybe this notion of isomorphism to clear the situation with respect to our harmony. 
You have also that A and B is not, although integrable with A and A implies B, remember the content of the introduction and the elimination rule for this circle talk, you have to be beginning. They're also not isomorphic. Yeah? And finally, well, this was a type of maybe we used to later, I'm not sure, I'm not sure on this one yet. That A implies B and B implies A, and A is clearly interderivable with A implies B and B implies A and B. But they're not isomorphic. And to get a bit of a flavor of when isomorphism holds and when it doesn't, at least in the restricted language consisting just of implication and conjunction, um, you can think of the following. So that two propositions are isomorphic if and only if when you interpret the letters occurring in the proposition as finite set of a certain cardinality, and you interpret the R, the implication, as the implication of two propositions as the set of functions from the antecedent to the consequent, and the conjunction as the Cartesian product, then the two propositions are isomorphic if and only if in every such interpretation, the interpretation of the two propositions has the same cardinality. So that A and A and A have not the same cardinality is clear because if you interpret A as, say, a set with three elements, and you take the conjunction as being the Cartesian product, and the Cartesian product of a set with three elements with itself will have how many elements? Well, uh, three, two, the cube, right? So nine. That's one. No, two, three, three, eight. Anything else? Four, four mm. Anyway, I'm, I'm very bad. It's kind of calculated. But um, you get a, yeah, because you can pair every pair, and, I mean, well, this is clear one. And I mean, it's similar, I mean, the, the, you, can, you can think of these, I mean, if A and B are just finite set of different cardinalities, then A implies B and B implies A, the Cartesian product of these two propositions we just have in set with, yeah? but then the Cartesian product of these two sets with A and with B respectively will give you two sets of different yeah. Which is a result by Colodia being a few one. Okay. Um, now, Costa Dogen, in, in, in a paper devoted to the Norton Avalanche of Proof, this kind of survey from 2003, observed that, um, well, the two sentences are isomorphic, means that they behave exactly in the same manner in proofs. Um, it seemed reasonable to suppose that isomorphism um, analyzes propositional identity, that is, identity of meaning of sense. So, two sentences that express the same proposition, you can only they are isomorphic, so that, that's kind of suggestion by, by Costa Dosha. And again, I mean, so isomorph, so saying that two propositions are, have the same meaning is certainly something more than saying that they are interdervaluable. And this notion is a kind of candidate from a proof theoretic perspective, at least. Now, let's compare very quickly this situation with kind of other accounts of harmony, such as the one that goes back to Belna, just, just for those that are familiar with that. <laughs> so Bella, I mean, analyzed no more and no less condition roughly using conservativity and uniqueness, and both conservativity and uniqueness are defined merely in terms of derivability, right? So in order to characterize harmony that way, um, you don't need to say anything about identity of propositions, and so uh, identity of proofs, sorry, and so it is not that that kind of account of harmony naturally lends itself to this give rise to a notion of endomorphism, yeah? And so it's one may call it a kind of extensional account of harmony compared to an intentional account of harmony that I mean that I will try to okay. So observe just that to have to be able to draw a distinction between I mean to, to have uh, to draw a distinction between an intentional and an extensional account. So in order to have a notion of isomorphism distinct from interdevelopability available, the notion of identity of proof, so this equivalence relation on derivation, should be non-trivial because if you put all derivations of a from B in the same equivalence class, then it is obvious that, uh, in particular, every derivation of A from A will be equal to the identity derivations, and so any two interdivable proposition will also be isomorphic. Yeah? Um, and however, in the in the case of say propositional intuitionistic logic, and and also of second order, um, and also of second order logic. The equivalence relation induced by beta and eta, uh, so by reduction and expansions, 
is, um, is non-trivial. And in the case of propositional intuition, this logic is also the maximum. So if you, you can, if you, if you extend in any way the equivalence relation induced by this transformation that I sketched in the previous slide, then however you extend it, you are thereby identifying any two proofs which have the same conclusion and same assumption. Yeah. Uh, so, time to try to, I mean, I think you can imagine how we can do so in the end. So the idea is that we can kind of distinguish two notions of harmony, maybe. One um, is kind of weaker, and uh, it is the one that arises when the I content and the E content are two interdriving propositions. Um, and we can introduce a strong one by saying that the I content and the E content should not be equal, but we can relax the equality to isomorphic. Yeah? And, and the idea is that, well, uh, in this way, we would like to, to be able to say that circle dot is N only weakly harmonious, whereas this junction is strongly harmonious, yeah? Uh, there's still a problem, however, or unfortunately, but not, 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 not terrible, but there's a bit of a problem, namely that in second order propositional logic, A or B and, and this for all X, A implies X and B implies X implies X, are formally not isomorphic, isomorphic. Um, and nor, nor is A isomorphic with for all X, A implies X implies X. So if you take the, so if you take these two derivations and you plug you take this and you plug it on top of the other, um, so actually in one, in one direction it works. So if you pass from A or B to the second order proposition and then back to A or B using these two deductions, shrinking, 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 you get, no, sorry, if you start from the second order proposition, you pass through A or B and then back to the second order proposition, you can shrink to the identity, but not in the other direction. So it's just kind of half isomorphic. Uh, but uh, the problem can be solved, however, by, uh, as I said, what is the, the equivalence relation induced by reduction and expansion is the maximal, or actually the maximum in, um, in propositional intuitionistic logic. In the second order case, this is not the case. So the solution consists in replacing this equivalence relation induced by reduction and expansions to the second order connective with a stronger equivalence relation. I would like to give you a, a hint of how this equivalence relation is defined, but I think I should move on. But if you want, we can discuss that. Uh, I mean, I can give you some more details later on. And well, and this sort of stronger equivalence relation, uh, I would refer to that as epsilon, gives us the wanted result, namely that we can modulo epsilon, remember isomorphism is relative to the choice of an equivalence relation of derivation. So if we choose this stronger equivalence relation of derivation, we can show that more things are isomorphic. It is still trivial, it is still non-trivial in the sense that there are interderivable things that are not isomorphic. And then it gives us essentially the desired result. Uh, so, um, so we have then a weak notion of harmony when the I content and the E content are just interdivisible, and a strong notion of harmony when the I content and E content are epsilon isomorphic proposition in second order propositional logic. <laughs> so that, that's very nice because we, we reached what we wanted, namely that we can say, well, Circle dot is merely weakly harmonious, uh, whereas this junction is strongly harmonious, as well, almost as conjunction, if you like, in the sense that conjunction you really have this even stronger notion where I content and E content are doing the same thing. Yeah? Um, now, one can argue, well, maybe it can force, but it's very, very heavy machinery and maybe a bit hard work. However, there are some formal results that actually show that the choice of epsilon is not ad hoc at all. In particular, um, it induces the maximum, it is the maximum consistent equivalence relation of derivation on the specific fragment of second order propositional logic that you need 
in order to encode the, the content of collection of rules. So, um, in order to encode the content of introduction and elimination, we don't need a full power of, of second order logic, but just a restricted class, I mean, but just a, a fragment of second order propositional logic. And for this fragment of propositional logic, the epsilon uh, equivalent relation is the maximum here consistently. And, and, well, and moreover, this, this equational theory, so this, this equivalence relation, is exactly what you need in order to kind of translate proposition, uh, sorry, derivations which are equivalent modulo the standard equational equivalence relation in propositional logic into second order logic. So there is a translation from propositional intuitionistic logic into second order logic, and and two derivation may be equivalent in the sense that you can obtain one from the other using reduction and expansion, but the translation may fail to be equivalent by just using reduction and expansion in second order logic. So if you want to kind of preserve not just derivability but also the relation of equivalence between derivations, you need a stronger theory, which kind of suggests that the choice of this epsilon is not at all, no, not, not at all but uh, actually rather natural, at least if one is interested to study the behavior of propositional connective from a second order perspective. Um, so I've been speaking for three quarters of an hour. Uh, may I take like five minutes more? Awesome. Yeah. So the very last point that I want to make is the following. So okay, using this isomorphism, this notion of isomorphism, we can draw this distinction, right? But one could still ask, okay. That, I mean, we certainly had this feeling that the rules for circle dot are not as nice as the rules for conjunction, and it's nice that you presented a way of drawing this distinction. Yeah, but still, is there anything wrong about the rules for this circle dot, or is it just, you know, my personal taste? I want these rules not to qualify as top harmony, and I found a way to say that. Um, well, from this intentional perspective, we, we have actually arguments for saying, no, that those rules are really, there's really something bad about those rules. Um, or maybe, I'm not sure it's really about those rules for the circle dot, but at least for our connective, which very, that, that looks very similar in spirit, yeah? And if you have some five minutes more of nerves, I will just catch, maybe for those that are more proof theoretic, which are a bit of more improved theory, I guess we will, they will appreciate a bit more, but um, for the other, I ask for five minutes of patience. So let's consider um, this connective, I'll call it sharp. Uh, it has this introduction rule with three premises. If you can infer B from A and A from B and A, then you can infer A sharp B. Yeah? And it has three elimination rules. The first, the first two are kind of two modus ponens corresponding to the first and the second premise of the introduction. Yeah? And the third is an elimination rule corresponding to the third premise of the introduction. Yeah? So I guess um, not just the proof theories, but everyone sees that the I content of the of that we get from the introduction rule is A by B and B by A and A. And then the content of the elimination rules taken together is also the same because the first one tells you A by B, the second B by A, and the third A. Yeah. So the E content and E content are the same, so we have a situation of super harmony. Yeah. We clearly can have reduction and expansion that are roughly a melting pot of those for conjunction and implication. So, I mean, you, if, you, if, you, if you introduce A sharp B and then you eliminate using the first elimination, so here it should be a B, um, what you get here. Um, yes, this is correct. So if we first have the introduction, and then we apply the second elimination rule, so from B we infer A, then we can clearly reduce by taking the derivation B of B and putting it on top of the derivation of A from B. Right? 
and and then the third reduction is just one of the part of the junction. Yeah? And we have an expansion that consists in applying the three elimination rule and then introducing or discharging the relevant thing. Okay. Consider now a second connective, in which the third premise, so which has exactly the same rule apart from the fact that A and the A here are replaced by a B. I content is the same with B in place of A, and so is the C content. So again, we have a situation of top harmony, and we can also here define the reduction of the top. But now we consider a third connective, which we call the snapshot, <coughs> which has the same introduction rule as sharp, and the same elimination rule as flat. So we have a mismatch between the third premise of the introduction and the and the conclusion of the third elimination. Yeah? So the introduction content is A implies B and B implies A and A, and the elimination content is the same with the last occurrence of A replaced by B. Yeah? Clearly, the I content and E content are interdivisible, but they're not isomorphic. Yeah? So it is a case analogous to the circle dot that had at the beginning. And now, as in the case of circle dot, we may wonder whether we can define reductions and expansions. So for the first two elimination, it is no problem. It is a kind of correspondence, and the reduction works nicely. The problem is more with the third elimination, that B to B, where you have A as the corresponding premise. But it's no problem, because we have enough stuff to construct a derivation of B. And, and dually, although when we want to construct the expansion, although from A and B using the third elimination we get B in place of A, the other rule allows you to infer A anyway from A sharp B together with B. So we, we find a way of showing that what you get is no less than what you need, right? Um, however, using this, I mean, if we take the equivalence relation induced by this transformation, it is relatively easy to show, I spare you the, the proof, that, um, that, that these equations have the consequence of uh, inducing, um, well, we can construct a kind of chain of equivalence that from the assumption C, so the relation consisted just of the assumption of C, so the identity function of the set of C, brings us to a derivation D2, an arbitrary derivation D2 of C from C. So we can show that any arbitrary derivation of C from C is in the same equivalence class as the identity uh, derivation on C, which has the consequence of trivializing the notion of isomorphism because if in any, for any equation, of, for any equivalence relation of this kind, we have that isomorphism collapses on interdivisibility. And, and so we can actually say from this more fine-grained perspective that there is indeed something wrong with this natural connective, namely that it, well, that it trivializes the notion of isomorphism. So that this kind of uh, more fine-grained level just just get uh, becomes as coarse as the as that of the um, Okay. So that was the last part, just for you, but. I think I prefer to stop here and I mean I can show you the slides later on. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like from two like two millions of two millions of indexes and I guess I guess we have covered enough. So um the really long part. So uh so summing up, I mean the intention of understanding of inferential is we can distinguish between strong and weak forms of harmony. Weak and Moisius connective are fine from a derivability perspective. But they are they may not be fine if we are interested in more fine grained relationship between proofs and propositions. Um, question is is harmony decidable? Well we know that interdeliability in second derivability in second order propositional logic is undecidable. However, in the fragment that we that we need, it is decidable. This is a uh, so Together with with with, with Paul Pistone, a 
project from keeping and not move to Bologna in Italy, we, we investigated this fragment of, of second order propositional logic, which is exactly needed to code, say, the introduction of the elimination group. And, and we showed it the side of it. Because essentially, this fragment is isomorphic to intuitionistic propositional logic. Um, and that is the side of also the fragment is the side of the rest. And so is this weak notion of harmony. Whether the strong notion of harmony is decidable is an open problem. So whether one is whether the notion of isomorphic for well the notion of isomorphic for yeah for this fragment of second order propositional logic is an open issue. As it is the notion of isomorphic for the full propositional intuitionistic language. Um, but anyway, it's an interesting question that 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 certainly could be one one should want to answer it. And the second question is a bit related to the last part. So whether there are strongly harmonious rules beyond those that you get using an inversion principle in the in the style of of Franz for high style of this thing we and so in a sense uh, since the notion of isomorphism is a relatively restricted notion one may expect that there are not that many options to obtain a collection of elimination rules which perfectly so that strongly that is strongly harmonious with a given collection of introductory rules and well and, and that was. Thank you.